I would like you to sit down. Okay. Uh, I'm so sorry, but uh, the problem is that our participants are online. That I, if, if they want to, uh, if I want to be in touch also with them, I must sit down. Okay. But I'm so sorry. I am very uh, happy that I can see you now today here. But I will, I will say. Thank you so much for your presence, for 
your attention and now I would like to ask Witold Dombrowski for directing a few words to us. Thank you.
This used to be a passage from the Christian to the Jewish part of the week. And even the incredible work that the Grotska Bay Event Theatre has done and is still doing to uncover and keep alive the memory of the Jewish past, past of Lubin, I cannot think of a better location for the centre. So uh, please join me around the applause here to be those. Now, by the same token, the subject of the project, 21st century literature and the Holocaust in a comparative and contemporary perspective, is, I believe, especially relevant nowadays. With the increasing migration crisis, with the rise of nationalisms, we urgently need the research that looks into the ways in which contemporary literature engages with the Holocaust, this most extreme manifestation of problematic xenophobia. So, as Jakob Lopez, Susan Rubin, Suleiman, and James Pillar point out in one of the, in the collection of essays on uh, Holocaust narratives, just as Holocaust has become ever more part of the global memory, and various significance goes far beyond any single group or nation, Holocaust narratives can become the ground for ever widening reflections on the relation between ethics and cultural production. Now, it is precisely the comparative perspective adopted in this project uh, that allows not only to identify literary strategies unique to particular cultures, as well as those which appear to be transnational in character, but also to explore their wider ethical implications while respecting the singularity of the show. So, by comparing and contrasting contemporary literary representations of the Holocaust in a variety of languages and genres, uh, this project and this seminar will certainly do justice to their diversity and complexity as attested by a truly interesting range of papers that will be presented today and tomorrow. So I wish you all two rewarding and enjoyable days of fruitful exchange of ideas and I hereby declare the seminar open. Thank you.
won the about literature uh, because it's going to be about culture, politics, uh, so, um, about things we like much. Uh, the title of Holocaust and Legitimate Culture is in Poland after uh, 1989. Uh, here you can see the abstract, and it is not a presentation what I'm going to show you, what will be shown on this screen. It's not a uh, strict presentation. Uh, these are excerpts, uh, fragments, pieces of, um, uh, of the paper. Uh, but they will be, I hope, they will be useful. Uh, In July 2001, at the height of the debate on the book by Jan Tomasz Gross, an article by, Jan, by Andrzej Nowak entitled Westerplatte or Wielbawne was published in the Rzeczpospolita Daily. The author considered the starting alternative and characterized the current state of historical sciences. Novak noted that today in Poland, one of two historiographies is practiced, either monumental or critical. Monumental history is a series of lofty examples, a feature of honor, while critical history finds corpses and tracks down criminals. Its task is to detect the sins of our past and condemn the perpetrators. The clash of both is a clash between the history of national glory and the history of national shame, or rather, I quote, an aggressive attack by the latter on the former. So this is an attack by the shame on the pride, on the honor. The text makes us aware, well, I present you some part of this article. It's rather famous, well known, uh, but to some extent misunderstood. So the text makes us aware of the obvious things. Westerplatte and Wielbawne exist in Polish history. And there is a contradiction or there is a conflict between them. On what day there is a conflict between Westerplatte and Wielbawne? It is the level of society that bases its present on narratives about the past. It is also the plane on which the moral evaluation of history takes place, and thus the balance between good and evil. I assume, I'm ascribing to Novak the maximum of goodwill, that he doesn't say Jedwabne didn't happen. The point is that historiography should explain the relationship or the conflict between Jedwabne and Westerplatte. History, as it follows, is never just about history. So what is it all about? Why does Andrzej Novak, in the space of two paragraphs, move from Westerplatte to pride and from Jedwabne to shame? Why, many years earlier, Boinsky, in his memorable essay, Poor Poets Look at the Ghetto, called for a massive confession. Why did Jan Tomasz Gross write his
seems that the problems are solved. So uh, why many years earlier, uh, Jan Wojski in his essay proposed, look at the ghetto, call for a massive confession. Why Jan Tomasz Gross did write in the end of the book about the fact that every society bases its life on truth. I think that all these answers, as well as thousands of others from researchers and writers, such as Jan Matutarska Bakin, Barbara Engel, Jan Tomasz Gross, Jan Gehovski, point us towards a legitimate culture. And although none of the authors mentioned have used this term, I will try to tell the story of the disputes over the Holocaust from this side. My hypothesis, uh, well, Announcement 
can be seen in almost all cultural registers. A third communication circuit was created, which remained separate from state structures and the underground culture of solidarity. Art zines, it has magazines created entirely by home industry, play a huge role in the third cycle. Several artistic groups were born, such as Tot Art in Gdańsk, Kultura Zrzuty. The, the happening Orange Alternative Movement was established in Wrocław. There are also two most important literary related magazines, Czaskultury in Poznań and Brulion in Krakow, which treated opposition culture in a mocking and satirical way. A significant feature of these undertakings was a new type of participation, focused on a group bond, on co-activity, on expanding the aesthetic experience so that it encompassed the process of reception. Such attitudes were also visible in well-organized circles of science fiction literature enthusiasts or in musical subcultures from rock to punk. All these activities signal that social communication no longer fits into the, into the dichotomous authorities opposition division in which Polish symbolic culture got stuck after martial law. The new initiatives introduced not only the third set of values, but also new forms of association and activity. All this without looking at solidarity, the opposition intellectual elite, or the church. The essence of such mass movement was the creation of a diversified culture, anchored in everyday communication practices, enabling a fuller participation of every human being, not referring to authorities. These activities were guided by a new cultural myth the myth of radical pluralism. In a radically diverse society, the idea was that everyone could create and participate in culture according to their own needs. It was just a distracted movement, artistic activity. In this multiplicity were projects of a different society, horizontally linked and therefore less hierarchical not accepting any authorities, consisting of many loose communities, showing no aggression between groups. This new society came to the fore, came to the fore in the form of multiple, varied and relatively equal activities. However, it was necessary to consolidate this multiplicity, and this could be done by accepting a narrative that would justify non-conflict as the principle, non-conflict or non-violence rule as the principle of coexistence. <coughs> An expressive attempt of, at such grounding could be seen in the prose of the time. <coughs> Let me list the most important books from the period 1985-1989. Hanna Kral, Supernatorka, as you see the list mentioned <coughs> in front of you. Uh, Hanna Kral, Supernatorka, Andrzej Szczypiowski, Początek, Begin, Paweł Hille, Weiser Davide, Piotr Szewc, Zagłada, Jani Henejski, Tadeusz Nowicki, Bochum, Adolf Rudnicki, Teatr Zawsze Grany oraz Krakowskie Przedmieście, Pełne Desert, Theatre Always Play, Krakowskie Przedmieście, Full of Desserts. Jarosław Marek Rękiewicz, Umplak, Umszlakplac, Henry Grimberg, Kamsz, Andrzej Kuśniewicz, Nawrócenie, Conversion, Jacek Bocheński, Stan po zapaści, Post Collapse State, Jan Błoński, mention, I've mentioned this essay for folks. All these works were published in a very short period, 1985-1989, so before the political breakthrough took place. If culture, if culture is the design and practice of society, then at that time in history, culture practiced a pluralist society. 
and it did it based on the memory of murdered social differences. After all, out of all the above mentioned texts, various minorities which had disappeared returned to us Jews, Belarusians, Ukrainians, Lenkos, Lithuanians, Kashubians, Gypsies, and also Orthodox, Protestants, Greek Catholics, literature recalled these differences, taught how they disappeared, and presented the Polish community of the 90s coherently anti communist, homogeneous, but melancholy at the same time staring longingly at the past, unable to awaken life energy. The price for anti-communist unity was a kind of sleep, a state of collective lethargy. Thus, the writer suggested that more important than defeating communism was the formation of new social relations. And the basis of such relationships must be the rule respect the other. Without concern for social differentiation, collective life dies. In this way, the idea of a pluralist democracy founded on tolerance towards the other emerged from literature. Its cornerstone was the tombstone, the memory of the sin of indifference towards social minorities. Building a social order based on the ethical principle of respecting the other and the rule of non-violence has a deep and depressing justification in past experiences. The design. The design, however, had at least three troublesome features. Firstly, it founded an order of representation of social differences based on social differences that didn't exist anymore. Jews, Lemkos, Kashubians, Ukrainians, Belarusians in Poland. These were, in the 90s, minorities non-existing in Poland. It means that the patrons of minority democracy proposed by Polish literature in the late 80s and early 90s became the ghosts of the dead rather than the bodies of the living. Second, the exclusion of violence once used by the majority was based on the story of its victims and this brought the messianic element to the new period, expressed in recognizing suffering as a legitimation of participation in history. Third, the dramatic relationship between the violent majority and the discriminated minority weakened the sensitivity to victims belonging to normal society, which was largely due to the omission or minimization of economic issues. In the books I have mentioned, there were no defeats, humiliations, or discriminations caused by the market. And capitalism only existed here as a background. Despite its shortcomings, this idea would have a chance of success if it was followed by the process of rebuilding Polish religiosity and historical awareness, the transformation of school education and everyday customs, and the creation of a discourse taking into account the economic differentiation of Polish society. However, things turned out differently. The emancipatory story conveyed by literature became the moral guarantor of the new legitimate culture. Its basis was questioning collective times. By supporting this critical movement, Polish emancipatory culture entered an involuntary collaboration 
with the capitalist transformation. How Polish legitimate culture stole the Holocaust in the 90s. The deregulation of collective ties, collective bonds, social ties, turned out to be the platform for the meeting of capitalism and the emancipatory culture supporting the other. From the point of view of emancipation movements, only the dismantling of the existing collective identities gave the other a chance for equal rights. The other means in Polish culture primarily a woman, a sexual misfit, and a Jew. The delegitimization of Polish masculinity gave rise to hopes for loosening patriarchal ties and allowing a woman's story about Polish reality to speak out. The weakening of the heterosexual regime provided opportunities for sexual minorities. From the perspective of ethnic minorities, especially for Jewish minorities, it was necessary to dismantle nationalism, that is, the ideological basis of violence against the other. Let me repeat, the condition of equality was to reveal the discriminatory aspects of nation, Polishness, patriotism, Catholicism, or masculinity. That is why the 90s was an unprecedented decade in Polish culture of analyzing violence inherent in collective identities. As a result, a weaker, discriminated, neglected, and marginalized entity gained the chance of fuller citizenship. The subject, however, didn't enter an equal world. The new world was breaking down existing ties because they disturbed both democracy and capitalism. The political transformation in Central Europe began thanks to mass protests. But the change of the regime was based on the dismantling of all collective entities. There would be no solidarity and there would be no victory of 1989 if it were not for the industrial proletariat. But there would be no Polish capitalism if it were not for the hasty dismantling of the working class. In the early 90s, all collective entities workers, farmers, the intelligentsia, turned out to be winners, defeated by the history they had unleashed. The process of dismantling the collective entities made culture faulty without guilt. Polish culture and the economic transformation work on the same thing, the regulation. The goals were different, but the effects were similar for a time. Cultural works aimed at making people aware of the harmful power of the male, family, nation, or community, and pointed to the need to develop new bonds, new ties, based on choice, granting more freedom to each individual, focused on equality and reciprocity, taking into account openness, Capitalism was not interested in new types. Transformation was enough to transform collective entities into a collective of separate, separate entities. The difference, however, was blurred where neoliberal rhetoric met with emancipatory discourse. The neoliberal attacked the social demands of workers and peasants. The supporter of emancipation criticized the oppressive nature of the male-centered national or Catholic community. Criticism of collective entities turned out to be the platform of the meeting. Due to this platform, Polish liberal capitalist democracy appropriated the Holocaust. In this case, the assimilation was to transform the Holocaust into the strongest evidence that a collective entity 
such as the nation, is morally suspicious and socially dangerous. Liberal capitalist democracy turned the Holocaust into an argument in favor of the weakening of social ties. The neoliberal rhetoric implicitly said, don't associate with any community linked by ideology. Remember what nationalism and racism did to the Jews. Be aware that ideological unity sooner or later would lead to violence. And the persuasion machine of the 90s, an effective defense mechanism against collective identities was created. If workers acted in the name of workers and class interests, it was called a claim attitude. And accused of trying to return to communism. On the other hand, if someone referred to national values, they were accused of nationalism and warned that such an attitude had once led to the Holocaust of the Jews. Thanks to this, this is next hypothesis. Polish legitimate culture in the 90s stole the Holocaust as its own legitimation. Thus, it became possible to use the Holocaust as a sign that allowed one to locate oneself within a legitimate culture. The new public ritual consisted in joining the liberal community by repeating the expressions of condemnations towards the perpetrators of the Holocaust. In this way, the capital of liberalism grew, and at the same time, the process of working through the Holocaust was simplified. Instead of new education, the renovation of Catholicism, instead of a profound reconstruction of social relations, reflection, and moral evaluation of post-war times, a simple ritual emerged, Polish culture has created a utilitarian sacrament. A profanation of this sacred became the play of Paweł Deminski and Monika Strzelka play for child, entitled Play for Child, staged in 2009. The authors invented an alternative and unchanging, at the same time, unchanging history. The Second World War in this play was won by Germany but from 1968, all of Europe was systematically plunging, plunging into the religion of the Holocaust. All life in this hypothetical Europe, or fictional Europe, all life is built on the dominant trauma. This trauma releases from the obligation to rethink the national or regional specificities of collective life. I quote, uh, uh, a piece from, uh, from an article. In post-Nazi Europe, invented by Strzemka and Deminsky, no one pays attention to national roots anymore. The feeling of guilt has spread even like dirtiness in a well-known poem. And the cultivation of trauma has become the only common ritual that arouses strong emotions. The authors of this performance show a history in which only one narrative dominates, only one group of victims has the right to survive in their memories. Other problems, other than the Jews, the Holocaust, other problems must give way to just trauma. As a result, we have become a society of post-memory which imposed this post memory on ourselves. Play for a Child was aimed at a culture that had familiarized the Holocaust on a popular level, but it was also directed against a principle that turns the field of social memory into a battlefield for exclusivity. In this context, it is necessary to briefly describe the methodological changes in the study of the Holocaust. With the publication of Gross, Jan Tomasz Gross' book, Jedwabne, 
Holocaust thought in Poland shifted to a new paradigm. I would like to call it the paradigm of the ordinary or the normalcy paradigm. The emergence of this paradigm dates to the 90s. Foundational texts you can see, I won't uh, name them uh, again, it's not necessary. Foundational texts include books from Zygmunt Bauman to Fred Katz and Daniel Goldheim. The previous paradigm, which dominated Holocaust research until the 80s, might be called a pathologizing paradigm. It was based on the assumption that the Holocaust was a departure from the main path of European culture, a path marked by humanism and progress. As a violation of modern ideals of freedom, equality, and solidarity, as a destruction of the humanizing nature of work, as well as a departure from Christianity, the Shah was interpreted as a kind of accident in historiosity. Sociology, historiography, political sciences and, sciences and psychologists studied the Holocaust with an eye toward identifying its deviant aspects in the patholog pathological cycle of the torturers, in the insanity of ideology, in the abusive methods of educating young people, and the conditions governing the function of key institutions. A harbinger of the new approach can be found in Dialectic of Enlightenment by Theodor Wiesengrund Adorno and Max Horkheim, or in Hannah Arendt's Vanality of Evil, as well as in analysis of the famous experiments of Stanley Milgram and Philip Zimbabwe. A more complete delineation and articulation in the last decade of the 20th century shows that the new paradigm is focused on the study of ordinary people in extraordinary situations. Analyzing cases of dehumanization explanations are sought here not in human nature but in contextual conditions. The normalcy paradigm inquires not into the notions said to be violated during the show, but into those whose implementation allowed the Shoah to happen. To conduct research on the Shoah under the new paradigm means to analyze the ordinariness that had to be created so that a mass crime requiring mass cooperation could be committed in plain view of the masses. In light of the normalcy paradigm, the Holocaust was not a pathological growth upon European culture, but the culmination of some of its ideals. In Polish research on the Shah, the transition to normalcy paradigm has already occurred. The new perception becomes apparently thanks to a long-term perspective, allowing us to situate the conduct of Poles during the Shah against the backdrop of earlier decades or centuries. So it is a list, of course, not the full, but the complete list of, uh, of books important for this new paradigm. Uh, so there are analysis of Polish public discourses and beliefs, post-war textbooks for teaching Polish literature by Silvia Karola, images of the Jew and the Jewish woman in Polish culture, the history of assimilation, centuries old anti Semitism, economic relations before, during, and after the Shah, the analysis of everyday social relations and the narratives, religious, legal, and quotidian, ordering those relations serve to explain Polish behavior during the Holocaust. But, in opposition to what was said on the occasion of Play for a Child, research on the Holocaust in Poland was heading in the opposite direction than founding collective life on one trauma and dominating collective memory by post-memory of the Holocaust. In a nutshell, the normality paradigm 
aimed at specification, that is the location of events in a specific place and time, embedding research in everyday life, preventing the birth of the cult of victims on terms other than those provided by the rules of commemoration in a given community. These studies allow us to understand the violence, xenophobia and anti-Semitism nested within post-war social relations. They were interested, all these studies were interested not in strengthening legitimate culture, but in rebuilding the culture of everyday life. But legitimate culture assimilated them and changed into a factor of loosening social ties. Fifth part, how to produce pride out of the Holocaust or the birth of the second legitimate culture. Let's go back for a while to the central category of my lecture. Legitimate culture is an official culture sanctioned by social institutions. Pierre Bourdieu states that this is the dominant cultural arbitrariness, the reproduction of which influences the construction of power systems and power relations. It, the legitimate culture, dictates the applicable patterns of reading, writing, speaking, behavior, and at the same time, defends them and cares for their inviolability. It dictates a lifestyle that makes it possible to evaluate all other lifestyles. At the same time, this style is not questionable because it creates mechanisms that prevent the knowledge of its basics. Shortly speaking, legitimate culture in relation to the Holocaust defines how to talk about the Holocaust in order to gain prestige and how not to talk about the Holocaust under the threat of losing respect. The second legitimate culture didn't appear suddenly. It was partially prepared by the instrumentalization of the Holocaust in the 90s and in the following decade. However, important moments of its gradual crystallization can be indicated. That is, establishment of the Warsaw Uprising Museum and what is even more important, location of uh, uh, Warsaw Uprising as a cult above the ghetto uprising and cult of the ghetto uprising. National Day of Remembrance of the Cursed Soldiers, the March of Independence, Foundation of uh, the Alma Family Museum of Poles Saving Jews, and so on and so on. Both legitimate cultures are, which may be odd, but they are similar in that they instrumentalize the Holocaust. Neoliberalism tried to build the legitimate culture on the fear of socialization. The right wing bases the legitimate culture on the fear of dependency. For the liberals, the Holocaust was evidence against strong communities. For the right wing, it is an argument for the need to strengthen national ties. First, legitimate culture was afraid of pride. Second legitimate culture can't deal with shame. As a result, both cultures are unable to connect contemporary everyday culture with the Holocaust. That is, to connect the truths about the Holocaust with the shaping of everyday life. Another common threat has more serious ramifications. The foundation of a collective identity on trauma is common to both legitimate cultures. The first of them used the trauma of the Holocaust to loosen social ties. The second legitimate culture learns from the first. In 2015, the National Cultural Center announced the Trauma and Pride program. 
official trauma and pride program. And this is quotation. In a workshop, youths document a story, event, or character that is a cause of pride or trauma for the local community. It is preferred that the stories uncovered are from 1939-1949. End of quotation. Thus, the second legitimate culture begins with trauma, but tries to combine its shocking effects with national pride from the very beginning. Trauma should not work against the national community. This means starting a national economy of producing pride out of the Poles. Thanks to such production, we, the Poles, should take the pride in the sense of identity with, identity with those Poles who saved other people at the cost of their own lives. We should feel proud because we have the right to believe that we would have done the same in similar circumstances. We should feel proud because Poles who gave their lives for Jews are innocent victims who purify the guilt of other Poles. I repeat several times, should feel, should feel, instead of, uh, instead of we feel because the second legitimate culture falls into contradictions. First, it must produce pride in insulated products. We can praise the Ulma family who were killed by the Germans for hiding Jews, but it cannot be said that the Ulma family was denounced by the Gestapo by Włodzimierz Lesz, to the Gestapo by Włodzimierz Lesz, a navy blue policeman. The same was true of all Poles who were hiding Jews. They were afraid of their neighbors more than of the Germans. Secondly, current legitimate culture cannot proclaim that our pride in Poles saving Jews is also a model for today's conduct because at the same time the right wing is trying to introduce xenophobia into the legitimate culture, an aversion to strangers. Previously, I was talking about factual isolation. Now we can add historical isolation, pacing in time, separation of the past from the present. Only thanks to this, the current government can simultaneously open the Alma Ulma Family Museum and close Polish borders to strangers. Third, the current legitimate culture cannot proclaim the glory of the Ulmas because pride in this culture has been linked to agency. The highest prestige in the second legitimate culture, therefore, falls not so much to the innocent victims who died without a fight, but to the victims who died despite their actions. This is related to the deeply perverse transformation of Catholicism that is being carried out by the second legitimate culture. In fact, it is a tragedy complex that is a desire for heroism equal to the characters who took all the actions but lost to the stronger opponent. The tragedy complex contains the most import important features of the second legitimate culture. The most important threat is innocence. The innocence of Poland and Poles allows us to face the whole world and announce that we have been victims of the Nazi attack. Innocence makes it possible to demand redress or to generously waive all compensation. Innocence allows us to define the criteria of today's heroism. It allows us to formulate past merits. It is the basis for the expectation of respect and a strong social bond. Innocence, in other words, gives the lead in any negotiation 
but also holds the community together. The change within the innocence complex is that the second legitimate culture links it with agency. This means that the victim status is to be used to obtain the right to vengeance. The second legitimate culture needs victims not to praise pure good, but to praise xenophobia. The scheme is complex. Poles who saved Jews died at the hands of the Germans, but also because of the fault of the Jews. If there were no Jews, there would be no Ulmas. Thanks to such an effective economy, the cult of Poles saving Jews has a double benefit. It allows us to maintain hatred towards the perpetrators and towards Jews. Women. And the last part, where are we? <laughs> the second legitimate culture is the reverse of the first. The first, democratic liberal, didn't value culture and therefore granted it freedom. The second, right-wing conservative legitimate culture, values culture. And that is why it restricts its freedom. The first culture attempted to transform the Holocaust into a private affair of separate people. The second culture give, gives the Holocaust the status of a state affair and makes the Holocaust a problem that none of us have the right to resolve separately. So we are trapped. We are in a trap. Our research is protected by the first legitimate culture, which patronizes independent, independent university science and free public debate. The truth discovered within this culture was supposed to free people from lying and stop evil from repeating itself. It was, therefore, supposed to make society better. However, the liberal legitimate culture transformed the truth about the Holocaust into a break on all demands for social justice, especially on the economic level. The conservative legitimate culture turned the Holocaust into a factor of fear of losing sovereignty. In this view, Social sciences, such as history or sociology, should strengthen national bond, freeing us from all obligations towards Jews. Thus, the second legitimate culture aims to speak about the extermination of Jews without extermination and without Jews. So this is the trap. If the researcher wants to extricate himself or herself from the dialectics of pride and shame, he or she individualizes social attitude towards the Holocaust. If someone examines the Holocaust in search of collective regularities, he or she falls into the dialectic of pride and shame. Is it possible to research the Holocaust that will not support any present legitimate culture? Is research on the Holocaust possible that will not divide and hierarchize society? Shouldn't, shouldn't that be the purpose of meeting like this today? Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Czaplinski, for this very, very important voice. I think, I, I feel it, that this lecture is uh, very important for our project, for our uh, literary thinking about the situation which we can find in, uh, in books, in novels, in, in other texts on the Holocaust after 2000. And now uh, we have a good time for discussion. The problem of, ma of many
my seminar is that there is no time for discussion, but when I planned this uh, seminar, I thought about it that we should have a lot of time for discussion. That's why after all lectures there are uh, about a half an hour for discussion. Please take your voice, your uh, the floor is yours, and the ask Professor, uh, Professor uh, Chaplinsky. Now, 
I don't see. But that is why I asked you this question. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Mogę powiedzieć po polsku? Of course. Of course. Mnie się wydaje, że problemem jest taka choroba, na którą my chorujemy od iluś stuleci, która polega na tym, że jesteśmy tak bardzo skoncentrowani na sobie. Zapomnijmy o sobie na chwilę, najlepiej na zawsze. Mm. I problem się skończy. You see? <laughs> I agree. I agree. I agree. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, of course, there are some solutions, but not in a culture that works at a full strength, at a full power for the pride. Not in this kind of culture. It's not only Polish culture, but when we exist within such kind of a culture that uh, is built on and works only for pride, which is the most important value. So everything will be reproduced as I said, but if we can imagine different culture, culture without, without pride, for instance, in a deep sense, Christianity is culture without a pride. Yes? That was the very reason for which Jesus Christ came to us. Yes? Because he gave us an opportunity to omit pride. Dignity is not a pride. It's not the same. So it is another different model or form of culture within which Pride exists, maybe, but it's, it's not so important, yes? So maybe another model of culture, but not another model of a study over the Holocaust. Yes, you know, so perhaps the solution is to return, you know, to what you mentioned about the 1980s. You see, you know, her uh, circulation level. You yeah. know, the, the subculture which in a sense will be outside the two dominant cultures. If you think about, you know, new historicism, the ideas of uh, Sinfield that, you know, there is this ultra culture, but you can always have uh, a subculture which will have its own values and which will be outside the dominant discourse. Uh -huh. Well, thank you for this question. Uh, it seems to me that this short period between uh, the mid 80s and the mid 90s, uh, it is the uh, uh, short period of uh, uh, anarcho liberalism, anarcho democracy. I don't know. Uh, almost, almost freedom, almost freedom, uh, and subcultures. Of course, the impact of subcultures. What not was not so heavy, so important as uh, mass culture, as, as of ma mass culture. But uh, the most important thing for me was the model of society entertained, uh, practiced by the participants of uh, punk, rock, uh, 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 creators of art zines, uh, uh, fair circulation, and so on and so on. Well. Maybe you don't remember, but in the beginning of the 90s, pieces, small pieces, fragments of these subcultures entered the mainstream. So it was a kind of vivid chaos, fruitful, but short, short moment, three, maybe four years. Uh, of coexisting between mainstream and uh, offstream. Uh, and that was stopped or uh, neglected or uh, uh, dismantled or uh, uh, annihilated uh, in the second half of the 90s. And the impact of subcultures, alternative cultures, uh, uh, was so diminishing. Yeah. 
is it, do I, did I meet your, uh, your question, your, uh, your needs? Well, it was more of a comment than a question. I was just thinking about, you know, the, the way out of the trap. And, and I yeah, think it's I like my suggestion uh -huh. to do is it, yeah, that like the subcultures, maybe, maybe subcultures today, outside. Today's to subcultures. Yes. Yes. Today's subcultures. Well, uh, I have to think about it. I have to think about it. Can you give me some example of subcultures? You know, one example that comes to my mind is, uh, and actually I, I could use a, a person as an example, is this thing about... Uh, Shakespeare. For example, oh, Shakespeare. Yes, no, I, I was also thinking about... So, mm -hmm. it seems to me that it would be an answer keeping toward, uh, uh, toward the solution I was talking about previously. That is, toward the culture without pride, or toward the culture in which pride is not the most important element mm -hmm. in the center of the of the whole. Mm -hmm. yes? I, I was thinking about Jacek Kleif, you know, who, oh. who in a sense decides oh. that he doesn't want to be a part of this you know, mainstream culture, he doesn't want to be a part of the opposition of severity, and yeah. he chose his yes. third way. Yeah, yeah, orange or so 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 orange or alternative top art cultural shoot they were all the same or very similar and very, very important. So uh, today, yes, of course, yes, we should look at them. What do they do with the Holocaust? What do they do with their social and national identity? Yes, of course, you are absolutely right, but I'm not well aware. I'm not researcher of this uh, area of culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you are absolutely right. Yes, yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. I'm very interested in your opinion about the situation that um, after Holocaust and maybe first of all after 2000, we, we couldn't uh, find an interpretation, an religious interpretation of the Holocaust in, lit in literature. And we also think about it that uh, we live in post-Christianity society, but there are a lot of literature and texts about many, many, um, about many events, historical events, who and people gave some religious interpretation of it. But there is, I, I think so, no religious interpretation of Holocaust in the Polish literature and the Polish... Why? Uh, is, is it mean that Holocaust is nothing for, for all Christians? Uh, they think about that uh, Jesus Christ was very Jewish and uh, that uh, Israel is a chosen nation, but if the chosen nation is exter was exterminated in Poland, why there is no reflection on it? I don't understand this situation. Could you, could you, could you uh, speak a little bit? <laughs> well, uh, thank you. This is a topic, a subject for the next seminar or uh, huge conference uh, or even uh, uh, study lasting for many, many years. Uh, so. Yes, I agree with you that this is, this should be uh, uh, normal, not only basic, but normal uh, level and basis for uh, uh, the Holocaust study. Uh, small correction, there are, there are some books and interpretations and analysis of this uh, uh, phenomenon, there are. Uh, it seems to me that President uh, 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 Tomasz Polak, uh, at, at the beginning of the uh, previous decade oriented for a while the research, the Holocaust research uh, 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 into this area. Uh, so there are some texts, books, uh, uh, interpretations, analysis, that, but they are not bad. Mm -hmm. Yes? Mm, why not? Why not? I, 
maybe because the researchers uh, uh, are afraid of instrumentalization of this kind of research. To some extent, yes, of course. But uh, do you remember the last scene in uh, the film Pokoshi? Mm -hmm. Do you remember? It's a horror, a horrible scene uh, in which we can see a man hanged on a uh, uh, barn, barn door, barn's door. On the cross. Yeah. And there is a small uh, group of people standing around looking at him with uh, disdain face. And one of them says, like Judah, mm -hmm. like Judas. Mm -hmm. So, this is the shortest answer on your question. The perverse change, shift of religious in Poland the perverse is so deep that all values, categories, uh, orthodoxy was turned upside down. We are, we the Poles are a common Jesus Christ. So anything that happens to us is coming from the perpetrators, the traitors, uh, the evil people. Uh, so one cannot, one cannot stop the, uh, the Holocaust from the religious perspective without first stage, omitting first stage or first item, that is Rethinking the Catholicism, uh, the Catholic religious in Poland, rethinking the uh, uh, beliefs, social beliefs, because some of the crimes were committed under the sign of Jesus Christ. Yes? So, studies on, over the Holocaust, on the uh, religious arena should contain all those turnovers, all those uh, uh, schizophrenia, yeah? So it wouldn't be only about religious skills. <laughs> you are right. Okay. Thank you. But I would break coffee, uh, <laughs> cigarettes, a cigarette. <laughs> don't you smoke? No. In this country? No. Don't. <laughs> invited to uh, invent questions. Well, it will be, it will 
be complicated, I think. So I will reserve my question for later. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I thank you. Thank you for your lecture. For more information, does uh, theology and components uh, have any connection with the concept of the suffering God that uh, leaves the uh, Almighty God behind and, and goes for the suffering God who suffers with his people? Which is, I think, internationally or globally, a, a, a result more or less of what happened in the world. You, you are right, uh, uh, at least, uh, at least in one uh, in one point, uh, uh, we don't have Hans Jonas. Yes, we, we don't have anyone like Hans Jonas who wrote uh, 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 deep, thoughtful study about the relation between the Holocaust and the idea of God. Yes. Uh, what was your question? Because I didn't. Oh, if there was a, a connection um, in, uh, within Polish theology with the uh, idea that came up internationally and globally in the theology of the suffering God instead of the Almighty God, mm -hmm. and that idea, that concept, is is linked directly with the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And leads to yeah, leads yeah. to contradictions. Oh yes, <laughs> it's not not a solution. No, it's not a solution, of course. Of course. Yeah. I, was just, I was just curious of yeah. the idea. Uh, maybe it is maybe it, it is significant. Jan Bosch in his essay uh, proposed to look at the ghetto. Uh, uh, he wrote. Uh, do, do you remember this uh, this piece? Uh, mm, it was close to uh, to crime, but the uh, but uh, God uh, stopped the hand. Mm -hmm. The God forbids, forbade. Yes. So that's the way of thinking about the relation between the Holocaust and the religion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I remember a very religious conference which I which uh, in which I took part many years ago, and there were many. Uh, theologians uh, uh, in the room, and I asked uh, about the children of the Holocaust, because you know that the first signs in Catholic Church, there are Jewish children, which, which were uh, killed by Herods and uh, soldiers of, of, of him. And I asked, why we don't think in this way about the children of the Holocaust. Uh, they are, the, these, these victims of Herod, they were not uh, uh, Christians. There, there, there was no Christianity during this time. Uh, they, 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 they knew uh, nothing about Jesus Christ, and they are sons of Catholic Church. Why? the sons of Catholic Church are not uh, Jewish children, one, hand, one uh, and half of my own children who were murdered in this place in Catholic country. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and there was no answer, no answer for, for it. <laughs> That's it. I, why I said about it? Because it shows, uh, it shows very well the kind of thinking in a religious cycle about Holocaust and Jewish victims. In my opinion, Jewish victims, uh, and even John Paul II can do nothing in this, in this way. It's, it's nothing for, for Christian people. It's just one of the crime which was, uh, which was made, which was uh, which was occurred in history of of uh, in history of uh, of civilization, mm -hmm. and I'm very sad. It's really mm -hmm. very sad. And uh, of course, we live in, in post-Christianity uh, Europe and, and and culture, but 
but the mentality of people is still based on these values which everybody knows uh, for many for many years for, for, for centuries and I think it is it is very important also to think about this issue about Holocaust about about this event uh, 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 great letter great letter but but we should also um, think and to answer for this question why there is no no reaction no, re no religious reaction in literature on the beat well you have you have given us uh, a problem to solve or a problem to think over or a theme, a subject, a topic of our next meeting. Yeah. Do, do should we have done. any questions to Professor Czaplinski or we should go to the coffee break to foyer? Let's continue in the foyer. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. 